So we're going to start out with this. As I had mentioned, the Bible is black and white. I'll just say that again. I, I don't know, I, I don't really need to show you, but there's actually white space and then there's black letters. The Bible is black and white, and the Bible is black and white about what it in what it teaches about gray. The Bible is black and white in what it teaches about gray, and basically what we say is that the Bible teaches that there really is no gray. The Bible's black and white, and it teaches that there is only black and white, and there really is no gray, and therefore, we know that the world hates this whole black and white thing. Therefore, the world hates the Bible. <laughs> the world wants to express and celebrate diversity in opinions under the so-called banner of peace. Let's just celebrate everybody's opinion, and we can't make things black and white because people will get offended, and therefore we won't have unity, and there won't be peace, and, and we need world peace. And that's why we have the peace signs out there, because we want to have peace. That's what the world says. So the world hates the Bible because the Bible's black and white. The world wants relativism, meaning a variety of opinions. Therefore, without any therefore judgment or categories, especially in dealing with people. The world hates it if you identify somebody as being something according to what they really are. The world hates that. But like I said, the Bible is black and white, and the Bible makes a strong distinction between people. The Bible says that there are only two types of people in the world. The Bible says there's only two types of people in the world. Those in the light and those in the dark. We're going to see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. With those, with this, what we see, Jesus says this in Matthew 12, 30, that those that are with Jesus and those that are against Jesus, one or the other, you're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. Mark 1.15 says, those that are in the kingdom of God and those that are in the kingdom of Satan. It's one or the other. Exodus 20, verse 5 and John 14.15 says that there are those who love God and those who are that hate God, one or the other. Matthew 7.13 and 14, Jesus was talking about that there's those that are headed for heaven and those that are headed for hell. And with this, a very popular uh, pastor uh, made this very, very, very sophisticated observation about this truth. And as we live in this little, uh, this little community here, um, hopefully we could understand what he's saying here because it's kind of lofty. This is what he says, J. Vernon McGee. There are two kinds of people in the world, saints and ain'ts. And if you ain't a saint, you ain't. Very profound. And today we're going to see then the people of the day and the people of the night. Those in the light and those in the dark. We're going to see this. First Thessalonians, we're going to be in chapter 5. Verses 4 through 11 shows three aspects of those in the light and those in the dark that will help you to walk as people in the light. We're going to start First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5. The, chapter, the verse for today, the verses are between 4 and 11, but we're going to start to prime the pump on this particular section in verse 1. This is Paul speaking to the Thessalonians. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written for you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. They, them, those people. Verse 4, But you, but you, brethren, you can see the conjunction is completely a different crowd we're talking to because there's no gray area. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you all, for you are all sons of light and sons of day. 
We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others, as the others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, who they're sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath. But for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as also you are doing. And so, with this, Paul has been teaching about uh, God's plan for the end of time for all the people of the world. In verse 5, we see that. Paul is saying this, for you were not of the darkness that the day would take you like a thief. And the day that he's talking about right here happens to be what we talked about earlier in verse 1 through 3, the day of the Lord. He's saying that we are not going to be involved in that. And so for a quick review, as we go back to chapter uh, 4, at the end of verses 13 to 18, Paul talks about, <laughs> first of all, the hope of the rapture, which is when the saints will be taken up out of this mess. And he lays out how that will happen, that Jesus will come down into the clouds from heaven, bringing the souls of those who are, have already departed as Christians, and that their bodies, wherever they are, in the graves or in the bottom of the ocean or scattered everywhere, will then be reunited with, with the souls and new bodies in the clouds, and then right afterwards, we who are still alive will be taken up and our bodies transformed and immediately into our new bodies, and therefore we will then be with our loved ones and with Christ forever up there, to getting taken out of this mess. And then, at the, uh, as we talked about a few weeks ago in verses 1 to 3, the horror of the day of the Lord that we talked about, which the whole world will go through while we're not here. In today's passage, then, Paul now separates the two type of, types of people in the world between those in the light and those in the dark. And we already saw, then, the destiny of those in the light and the destiny of those in the darkness. And those in the light will participate in the hope of the rapture. Those in the darkness will participate in the horror of the day of the Lord. In this, With this, we're going to see, in this passage, the attitudes and actions that mark the various people. In other words, we're going to identify the attitude and actions of those living in the light and the attitude of actions of those living in the darkness. It's another <laughs> episode of who's who in the zoo that we do here. We talk about the Bible makes distinctions between people, and you're either a saint or you're an ape. Ain't. You're either part of a particular uh, flock, a flock of sheep, or the flock of sheep, which we talked about earlier. So as I said, this passage today shows three aspects of those in the light and those in the dark that will help you then to walk as people in the light. In other words, what you're supposed to be doing is what we're going to be getting at here. So first, he's going to show us the contrast and basically gives you a chance to look in the mirror and say, well, where do I fit into this thing? I think I'm okay, but let me look in the mirror. Verse, uh, verses 4, 5, and 7, the contrast of those in the light <clears throat> compared to those in the darkness. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. For those who do their sleeping at night and those who get drunk at night, I'm sorry, for those who sleep do their sleeping at night and those who get drunk get drunk at night. And this is also laid out somewhat in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14 that Paul gives us. But let's start out verse 4. But you, brethren are not in the darkness. It, it's, it's, this is a whole night and day black and white thing here. Either you're in the darkness or not. But you, brethren, the Christians, are not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. Which day? Which day? The day of the Lord. And what we see here in darkness is, and it's used throughout the Bible, darkness here means spiritual darkness. It means spiritual darkness, which is basically in the intellectual and moral realm. So when you hear uh, about darkness in the Bible, 
It talks about the intellectual and moral realm. Every time you see the word darkness in the Bible, almost every time there's darkness when it actually does become night, but it's generally showing uh, something that has to do with um, intellectual and moral uh, understanding. So first of all, if you're in the darkness spiritually, it means that you're intellectually indifferent and ignorant and basically clueless. It means you're living in the dark. It means you have your head buried in the sand. That's what spiritual darkness means as far as the intellectual part. It's somebody that's just completely clueless and doesn't get it. They have no spiritual understanding. They're numb. And the reason they're like this, Proverbs 1, 7 tells us, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In other words, the Bible says you don't know anything until you fear the Lord. You have really nothing to say. You have nothing of value to bring to the table. Until you fear God, you're basically a waste of skin. You, you, know, you have nothing to really contribute of any value because they didn't fear God. So the ones that are in the darkness know nothing of any real value. Yes, they can do this, and yes, they can fix this, and yes, they can do this mathematical problem, and yes, they can do this. But as far as anything important, they know nothing unless they fear God. That's the beginning of knowledge. This spiritual darkness also represents the realm of the morally evil and corrupt. So first of all, it's being clueless about spiritual things. And secondly, it's about living in the evil, wicked uh, state. And with this, they're blind to see the truth or even to see and appreciate goodness. They don't get it, and they don't appreciate goodness. They don't stop and ponder about, wow, that's really good, or man, I hate that. That is nasty. It comes down to where, do you really hate evil? Or, and, and do you really love good, or are you just kind of like whatever works best for you that day? That's the difference. And basically, these people that live in the dark are too blind to see the truth or goodness. Therefore, they're participating in the vicious cycle of foolishness, meaning, uh, I don't know, and then sin. And the more that they sin, the more foolish they become. And the more foolish they become, the more sin that they get involved in. And it keeps just going round and round. And then they finally, as Romans 1, 18 to 32 says, God finally gives them over. At some point, he says, you, you know what? You people don't want to fear me. Good luck to you. And they are sent off. And God just says, I'm not even going to restrain this person anymore. It's called the wrath of abandon. It's terrifying when somebody crosses that line that God has laid out in everybody's life. Is once they're gone, past that line, God says, just do what you want. Do we see that in the world today? Yeah, we see it all over the world. There's no limitations. There's nothing holding them back. And this is, like I said, laid out. God says this would happen already, Romans 1, 18 to 32. This darkness then is where the unbelievers are, and it's all throughout the Bible. John 3, 19, Acts 28, 18, Romans 2, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, all through the Bible, and there's more and more and more. <clears throat> Jesus explains Man's rejection of him. Remember Jesus, the light of the world? Jesus explains why they reject him. John 3.19, Jesus says this to Nicodemus. Three verses after John 3.16 that everybody knows. This is what John, Jesus says in John 3.19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. This is a black and white thing here. We know this is true because everybody in this room has lived and thought this way at some point. And we look back as Christians and go, yeah, I didn't like to be exposed. I didn't want this. And we know from Ephesians 2.2, 2, 2, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Colossians 1.13, all through the Bible, that the darkness then is in the realm of Satan. He owns that realm. He's been given the opportunity to be what's called the God of this world who blinds the eyes of those that are not in Christ. This is Satan's world that he has been given the opportunity to have 
some bit of a, an authority in this world for right now anyway, until that day. But you, brethren, <laughs> you are not in the darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. Again, this day we're talking about is the day of the Lord. Believers will not be taken by surprise regarding the day of the Lord. We will not be taken by surprise as a thief coming. And with this, Christians should not be surprised at everything even preceding the day of the Lord. In other words, look around and don't be surprised. The Bible says this would happen. And with this, you got to get this doctrine down right, because if you don't get this part right, you're going to go off and get involved in all kinds of ridiculous things, thinking that you're doing all these good deeds. This is what the Bible says, that the world will not get better, it will only get worse. You are not going to make this world a better place. God promised that these things would happen. So don't get shocked and saying, wow, the church really needs to step it up and do all these different activities to make the world a better place. When you recognize, like, no, 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 these are signs of the coming day of the Lord and that we are not to be surprised by these things. When we study the Bible, we see that, yeah, it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and I can't control what that guy does or control what that guy does. I can't be the moral police. You have to understand these things. This is how you live as a Christian. God promised these things would happen. Matthew 24, 6, Jesus said this, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. For those things must take place, but it's not yet the end. Don't be surprised when you see these things. Don't get all shocked and think, we've got to arm, we got to uh, uh, arm ourselves with signs and go spend a bunch of time over here and spend a bunch of time over here. And it, it's like, no, that's, that's not our job. Don't be shocked thinking that, oh, now we have this battle to, to make the world a better place. It, it, it's not going to happen. Our job, as you already know as Christians, is the Great Commission to make disciples of Christ and teach them to obey Christ and participate in teaching each other these things. With this, as I said earlier, the Christians will not be taken by the day of the Lord. We're not even going to be here for that. So stop living as if you're going to, if, if you're doing this, living as if you're going to need to save up for the day of the Lord and you better get this, this many supplies to last you seven years and you better get this and you better get this and, and by by you scurrying to Walmart for every single thing, thinking that you're going to be able to survive for seven years, when you should be growing in the Lord and doing evangelism, Satan's going to be laughing. Like, look at these fools. I got them running all around all scared. Yes, we need to be prepared for things, of course. But we don't need to be all frantic and freaked out, is what we're seeing here. A Christian, we are not going to be taken by the day of the Lord. We're going to be taken out. With this, true Christians will not be duped. And I say this all the time. You can't be duped. True Christians will not be duped by all the spiritual darkness and even the false teachers that are running around doing all these so-called miracles and all these freaky things that real Christians are going to look at that and say, well, that's, that's cheesy and whatever that came out of that guy's mouth isn't from the Bible, so I'm not going to get all freaked out by that. The true Christians are going to see what the Bible says. They're going to see what the Bible says instead of getting freaked out about a bunch of stuff. Verse 5, For you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor the darkness. Now, we all used to be of the night and the darkness. But now as Christians, we are in the light because of Christ. Let's see if this sounds familiar to anybody that's willing to cop out to this. Because Paul is saying this about all of us. Ephesians 2 Verse 1, and you, <laughs> you plural, meaning all you people, and you'll see that it actually includes me too, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, you know, all those people, we, Paul's talking about himself and I'm talking about myself, we all, too, formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But in verse 4 we see, 
but God made us alive in Christ, pulled us out of the realm of Satan, and is giving us the wake-up call, is slapping us around with his Bible, saying, you guys, just wake up and see the truth. You're not in that realm anymore. All of us were. So now, instead of being in the dark, believers are now sons of light and the sons of the day. Peter says this, 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now, we hear holy nation, royal priesthood. We think that's the Catholic Church. No, it's not the Catholic Church. Oh, well, then it sounds like the, uh, Israel. It does sound like Israel. But he's talking to Christians now. We, everybody in this room that's a Christian, is part of a chosen race. What kind of a race? Well, it looks like uh, there's different ethnic ethnicities in this room. A chosen race means those that are Christians. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Your job and my job is to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out. Yeah, I used to be like this, and now I'm like this, and that's why I'm so different. That's why I'm not following the rest of the sheep around that are running around doing all this ridiculous stuff that aren't from the same flock as ours. We're not part of that. We're called out. Our job is to go even to those sheep and say, wait, 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 wait. Here, you, you need to see the truth here because you're running around all freaked out about stuff. And I'm here to tell you that you can have hope and you don't even have to worry about all that stuff that's going down the tubes, as you see. So Paul says this, Now, for you are sons of the light and sons of the day. You're not of the darkness. And we see then, because we have the Word of God, which is the light. The Word of God that shows us and gets us out of the intellectual stupor of not knowing what's going on and being clueless. We have the Word of God, Psalm 119, 105. The whole, the whole Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, the whole point of it is to show how the written Word of God, not whatever this guy says or what that guy says or what this guy heard this morning, what this guy saw in his oatmeal this morning. No, no. What the Word of God is, the whole... Psalm 119 is about this in, in verse 105. The Bible is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is how you see what's going on. This is how you're not living in uh, this intellectual darkness anymore. Verse 7 then, For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. And the attitude here isn't necessarily a prohibition of alcohol. is isn't the whole point of this. It's an example of that Unbelievers are not sober, but clueless. They're under the influence of the darkness, and that's what this means. They're controlled by the powers of the darkness, Ephesians chapter 6. With this, being spiritual, spiritually drunk, they're susceptible to being duped and robbed. Okay, so you guys have seen it or heard about a, a drunk on the sidewalk, and, and he gets duped, he gets robbed, he gets tricked, he gets taken advantage of. That's what we're talking about here. This is the example. But they're spiritually drunk. It means that they can be duped by false religion or, or other false philosophies of man. The people that aren't Christians can get duped by this guy and this guy and this guy on TV and the guy over there that, that heard something. Oh, I, Like I said, I saw this in my oatmeal this morning or I heard this. Or, or, or they can get duped. But we have the Bible and we are, are well lit with the truth. With this, not only can they get duped by the false teachers, but they can be robbed of their salvation by going down these paths. And it says here that they do this at night. It's interesting because at night is where they think they can hide from God, ignore God, and disobey God. And that's where all the lies are. When you live in the dark, everybody knows that analogy. When you live in the dark, why does the crime rate higher at night? All these things, it's just, this is just totally obvious. Jesus says that they love the darkness. Why do they love the darkness? So they can do what they want to do, they think. With this, though, the example is this. Cockroaches run when you turn on the light switch. Everybody knows that. It's a perfect analogy. You turn on the light switch and they run. Why? Because they don't want to get caught. People do the same thing when you... 
start talking about the Bible. Hebrews 4.12 says it's a double-edged sword, and it's, it, it shines a light on your inside, and you say, I don't like this whole Bible thing. I'd rather go listen to this guy. He's, he's fun, but this whole Bible thing, it, it actually hurts. And, and, and this morning it just really hit me uh, that, that it exposed me, something I already knew, and it also kind of made me look stupid in front of my family and friends because they all know, and now we're sitting here together. I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to hear this Bible anymore. It's very uncomfortable. The Bible is the light, and we don't like it. Now, you could go somewhere where they, they have lights, <laughs> and the lights are really cool, <laughs> and, and the lights are all up on the stage and everything, but it's still dark in the, in the auditorium, <laughs> so you could feel comfortable. But the true light of the Word of God is a big ouch for everybody because we all have things to work on, and the light of the Bible shines in and, to our, and judges us. We don't like that, but that's the bottom line is. That's what the contrast is between those in the light and those in the darkness. Those in the light will say, all right, Lord, bring it on. And I, I, I'm living in the light. Everybody already sees it anyways. I already know. Um, so if you want to bring it on, just do what you got to do and do your surgery on me with your word. But I know it's going to hurt. But those in the darkness say, I hate when the light switch goes on, and I hate when those people preach what the Bible says. <laughs> and it proves what I'm saying. Then we see that that's the contrast of those in the light and those in the darkness. Now the commands for those in the light. In other words, the Bible actually tells us what to do. Verses 6 and 8. So then, let us, that's a command, let us not sleep as others do. You notice that Paul's, and, and so is Dave, saying let us. In other words, we're all in this together. <laughs> Sometimes he'll say, you, 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 but the bottom line is it's all of us as Christians. Let then, so then, let us not sleep as others, but let us be alert and sober. Verse 8 then. But since we are of the day, again, the other command, uh, along with this, is, is part of it, it's the same, just rewarded. Let us be sober, and then this second part, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So first we see the command of our attitude, how we think. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Let us be alert and sober. Let us not, here in the Greek, is a double negative. Now, I bring in the Greek. Why? Because it's the way it was originally written, and the Greek and the Hebrew always give you that punch that a lot of times the English can't give you. It's a double negative, and it means this. Let us not ever sleep in the way that he's going to describe. He's, he's, he's like, not only stop doing this, not only don't do this, but don't ever do this. He's going to talk about this particular sleeping. This, another, uh, as we see here, we have metaphors of day, night, darkness, sleeping. And he says, don't ever, let, don't ever sleep in this way. And the sleep that he's talking about is, once again, we kind of talked about it earlier with this, those in the darkness. This sleep has to do with being spiritually indifferent or ignorant and dull. And, uh, and, and therefore meaning clueless or careless about sin. It's basically saying, don't be stupid. Don't be foolish. Pay attention here. Don't be caught up in being clueless. Oh, I didn't know, or I don't really want to know. I don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. And, 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 and don't be careless about it. Wake up and pay attention is what he's saying here. And then he says, as others do. In other words, those people, them. The, the ones in the darkness. Remember, there's no gray. If you think you're sitting in the gray right now, well, I'm kind of in between. No, if, you're, if you think you're sitting in the gray or you're comfortable in the gray, what it means is you're really in the dark. And so this is, is us and them. But let us be sober and alert and alert throughout the Bible. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24 because that's uh, talking about the day of the Lord. Uh, alert is throughout the whole Bible, all kinds of things. Be alert, be alert, be alert. It means pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on. Pay attention to yourself. Look at the guy in the mirror every so often and verify what the Bible says and pay attention. And with this being alert, you guys know what too much coffee does. It causes you to really um, sometimes even physically be all messed up by it, that you're so alert that you're actually uh, kind of a, 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 a stage where you get jittery. And, and so Paul offsets this also. Be alert and sober. 
which means being well balanced, having self control, not all panicky. So, so be alert, pay attention, but don't be running around all panicky and worrying about every single little detail, uh, other than if it's a detail about your sin. But, but be alert, but not panicky, sober minded, having self control. Paul, I mean, Peter puts this whole thing together in how we deal with these nasty things. First Peter 5 8, you've heard this. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. In other words, just calm down, be sober, and but yet pay attention. Why? Your adversary, who? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion see, uh, seeking someone to devour. Pay attention because he wants to take you down, but don't be all panicky running around. Pay attention. Be sober-minded. Slow down. Pray about things. See what the Bible says about this. It's basically calmly applying biblical discernment of people and circumstances and then applying biblical wisdom to them. It means you're coming up on a situation. You might be ten tempted to panic, but using biblical discernment and wisdom, you could just slow down and say, wait, 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 wait. It's the same thing I use the analogy. If you're getting shot at, you got to shoot back. But if you have cover, then get your cover. And if you don't know what you're shooting back at yet, just hold on, calm down, and be alert, but be sober-minded and see what's going on. And biblical discernment with the whole Bible, especially in Proverbs and James, show you what you're looking at. Like, what's going on here? Okay, slow down and analyze what's going on here. Lord, I, something's going on here. i got to do something here. I don't know what to do. What does your word say about this? What do you, and pray about it. That's having discernment. And then wisdom is actually, what do I do now? Now that I know that this is going on in my life or in that person's life or something I see, the biblical wisdom is now, what do I do about it now? So understanding what you're looking at. In other words, understand that the whole world's going down the tubes and you don't have to get all panicky. You go, okay, wait, 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 calm down. Everything's just like the Bible said and I need to apply biblical wisdom to it. Oh, okay, then to be sober and alert. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. And this then, as we see in Ephesians 6, 18 to 20, is basically prayerful alertness for the warrior to be prayerful and alert, constantly bringing things to the Lord. And that's the commanded attitude for those in the light, to be alert, knowing what's going on, paying attention, but not all freaked out, to be sober-minded. Now that's, that's the attitude now, the armament, verse 8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on... This is the part, let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. And with this, then, you're, we are of the day. We're not of the day of the Lord. We are of the day where there's light. So don't get confused because Paul put it there and it, it, it shouldn't be confusing. But the day he's talking about initially was the day of the Lord that we don't have to go through. But now we are to live of the day, which means what day? It means today. It means this day. Not the day of the Lord. We will be removed from the day of the Lord, but we are to live this day, today. With that, we live in the loving light of the Lord on this day, today. They will experience the lethal light of the Lord on that dreadful day. So just keep in mind, this is what Paul is saying, black and white. Verse 8, here we go. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. And this is the armor of God that we see in Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 20. It's all laid out, and it's, it's something that you need to recognize that God help me, help me, God help me, God help me, help, God help me. And he's saying, put on the armor of God to deal with this spiritual darkness. Well, what's that? Well, Paul's going to talk about that. But basically, what he's saying is, is, you have some homework to do. You have some preparation to do. You have to understand these things. And where do we get the understanding from these things? According to what the Bible tells us, not our oatmeal. The breastplate of faith and love. First of all, let's look at the breastplate of faith. It's the outer, then, it would be the outer protection from lies coming your way in the form of flaming arrows tempting you not to believe God. Instead, uh, that you may believe the lies. And what this basically means is, is to be protected by the armor of faith 
from these lies that come our way that you see on the news, all this scary stuff or the temptation over here, or that wouldn't really, God wouldn't really be that upset with you if you did that. All these lies, but if you have the armor of faith, it means... I'm not going to believe these lies. I'm not going to believe what the news says. I'm not going to believe what this false teacher says. I am established in the um, the armor of faith of what I understand what the Bible tells me. I don't have to be freaked out about that. And this, I can just block it, say, nope, I'm not even going to let that thought come in because I know it's wrong. And if I let it come in, it's going to destroy me. It's going to destroy my thinking. That's the breastplate of faith. And Paul had described this in Ephesians chapter 6, 16 as the shield of faith. Here he's talking about the breastplate of faith, but he's, it's the shield of faith. And in, in Ephesians 6, he talks about that it, it, it guarding you from these flaming arrows. And we know that the flaming arrows, they're lies that come to you. They hurt when they first get you, but then they burn you all up. Because if you let them in, it not only hurts to let them in, but then they just eat, eat you up. And now you can't sleep because you're worried about this, worried about that. Those are the things that you need to put in the trash. This is the breastplate of faith. Because believing the lies will cause you to stumble on the battlefield, getting duped into spiritual failure. You start buying into that, and you're holding your shield up, and you go, huh? Oh, that's, wow, that might be okay. That might be, well, that might really be what happened. Well, the news says this, and boom, you're getting nailed with arrows, and you're going to get taken down, and your buddies that are along the skirmish line with you are going to go, come on, man, get a hold of yourself. You, you put your guard down. you got to keep your guard up and pay attention to this thing. Then we see the breastplate of love. And this is easy to understand once we compare it with other passages. The, it's the inner protection of the integrity of loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's the inner protection that you have of love that make, it keeps you from sinning because if you love God from the inside, it's going to keep you from sinning. Jesus says this in John 14, 15. You will love me if you keep my commandments. So with this, it's the same thing as called the breastplate of righteousness in Ephesians 6, 14. It means standing firm in loving God and being protected by your love for Him that inside of you, you will maintain integrity. Because you love Him, and you know that He's inside of you. You know that the Holy Spirit's inside of you. You know if you do that, if you let that inside of you, uh, if you let that sin or that thought inside of you, uh, you know that it will hurt your integrity. And if you lose your integrity on the battlefield, you're in big trouble. And so not being protected by the integrity of righteousness would be disastrous in your duty as a soldier because the whole world would just view you as just one of those other hypocrite Christians because you are just a liar. Uh, you, you act like this on the outside, but on the inside you're doing this, and so you have no credibility. And your buddies, again, you're walking, going along the skirmish line, and you're, you're, you're getting taken down. And you're, Come on, man, get a hold of yourself. Be a stand-up guy, and let's move ahead. Then we see verse 8 as the hope, I'm sorry, as the helmet, the hope of salvation. And we know there's two different kinds of hope in the Bible. One is, I hope that happens. The other one is, my hope is that I know it's going to happen. And that's the hope we're talking about, that the hope of your past, present, and future salvation. Romans 8, 29 to 30 talks about this, that you have, as a Christian, the hope of salvation. Therefore, this helmet he's talking about, and same with Ephesians 6, protects your mind from thinking that you may be headed for defeat and wrath. That, in other words, it means remembering the promise of God that you cannot lose your salvation. Because if you don't wear that helmet and covering your mind and thinking, you're going to be all over the place. Oh, well, I'm not really of God, and now I have to, I have to worry about my salvation. Maybe I'm not going to, maybe I am going to be at the day of the Lord. Maybe, and, and you start freaking out. But if you have the helmet of salvation, it reminds you, of what the Bible says is that once you're truly a Christian, not a false Christian, but a real Christian, you will not lose your salvation. So when you wear that helmet and things come your way, rocks, arrows, everything hits you, ding you on the helmet, you, you, you recognize, yeah, it, it might hurt. I might get this. This might hurt. But I'm going to heaven. That's the helmet of salvation, the hope of salvation. And throughout uh, the Bible, 
Paul uses all kinds of uh, illustrations using soldier passages. Romans 13, 12, 1 Timothy 6, uh, 2 Timothy 3. So we saw then the contrast of those in the light and those in the dark. And now we, then we saw the commands for those in the light. Now we're going to see the comfort for those in the light. That should be the comfort for all of us here. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encouraging one another, encourage one another and build up one another just as you're doing. The very beginning, for God has not destined us for wrath. Remember, put your helmet on and remember, God has not destined us for wrath. God has not destined us for wrath. Keep that helmet on and don't get freaked out. Jesus said this in the book of Revelation to the church in Philadelphia. And he encouraged them with this, and it's an encouragement to us who are his people. Revelation 3.10, Because you have kept the word of my perseverance. What's the word of my perseverance? Because you have kept the truth of the Bible, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Turn on the news for a minute. All these different things coming in this direction that are stressful, and now this guy says this, and now the government says this, and now this is happening. And if we are in the Bible, if we are operating according to his word, we are being kept out of the hour of testing. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. So, black and white. God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Christ Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. And with this, Jesus died for our sins. Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ died for us. He didn't die for them unless they want to accept the free offer, but he died for us. He already paid the wrath for us. So verse 10, another thing that needs to be explained, whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. So now we're getting into the whole metaphor of awake and asleep. And what he's taking us to, obviously then, is back to 1 Thessalonians 4.13, talking about uh, the, using the, word awake, the words awake and asleep in the sense of us that are awake, meaning all of us that are uh, sitting here breathing right now, as opposed to those that are asleep, meaning those are the ones that are in the graves. So now Paul's going back and using the same uh, metaphor of awake and asleep, of talking about our, lo our loved ones who have passed before us, our, our, loved fam our, our beloved family members who are Christians, whether it's them who are in the graves or us who are still alive, meaning us that are still alive at the rapture compared to those that are asleep and who have died in the Lord. All of us, of all Christians of all time, will be with the Lord. That's the encouragement we have. Whether it's our loved ones who are already in the grave, their souls are with the Lord right now, or us who are alive right now, we will always be together with the Lord. Verse 417. And so I want to sum up our salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, sum up our salvation in Ephesians chapter 1, just a reminder to help you with keeping your helmet on and your breastplate. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, he predestined us as adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intentions of his will, to the praise 
and of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him. With a view to an administrative suitable for the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heaven and in the earth, I'm sorry, things in the heavens and things on the earth, in Him also we have obtained, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Therefore, verse 11 and 1 Thessalonians 5, Encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. In other words, help each other to live in the light, live according to this truth that you have been chosen to avoid the day of the Lord. And therefore, encourage one another according to the true doctrine of the Bible because it doesn't matter what you saw in your oatmeal or what this guy heard over here. The Bible gives us as Christians encouragement to not be duped, but to look forward to the day when He comes to get us. Also, to encourage each other to stay alert, but calm down. <laughs> Pay attention. Don't, don't go off and do that, but don't get all panicky. Just calm down. And to help each other from drifting into the moral darkness of sin, building up the saints. And all of this towards our future hope of the future light, Revelation 22.5, the very end of the Bible. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of the lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. That's the uh, final glory in the light. So we saw these three aspects of those in the light and those in the darkness that should help you to walk as people in the light, to encourage one another. We saw the contrast of those in the light and those in the darkness. The saints and the ain'ts, black and white, no gray area. We saw the commands for those in the light. We saw the comfort for those in the light. And with this, with this, the Bible tells us that all of mankind are naturally against God and automatically headed for hell. All of mankind are born into darkness until something happens. But, this is the something that happened. It is possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ for somebody to be permanently transferred from dark to light. It is possible for anyone who is breathing to be permanently transferred out of the darkness and into the light. And get this part. It's impossible to be transferred back to the darkness once you're in the light. Romans 8, 29 to 30. Through Christ, then, there is this hope. And let's encourage one another as we approach this day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.